This conference will now be recorded. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Microsoft Excel One. In this class, I'll be introducing you to the very popular spreadsheet application known as Microsoft Excel. What I'd like to do is talk a little bit about um, what it is, what it does. We'll cover the basic fundamentals of Excel, okay, how it functions essentially, and then we'll jump into the program. We'll, I'll introduce you to the Excel interface so you understand the lay of the land, the menu options available, et cetera. And then we'll perform a series of exercises to build a simple worksheet and also introduce us to a number of the key tools and commands that Excel offers. Now, just a quick note that in this class, we are using Excel 2019, which is one of the more recent versions of the standalone program. As long as you have access to Excel 2007 or later, or if you have a Microsoft 365 subscription, uh, you'll see that whatever you learn in this particular version can be easily applied to those other versions. So in this class, we're gonna talk about the principles of spreadsheets. We're gonna look at the Excel interface or the screen or window, whatever you'd like to call it. And then we're gonna start entering and working with data. We're gonna perform some simple calculations, select ranges of data to uh, apply some basic formatting commands. All right, and then we're gonna print. Uh, printing from Excel can be a bit tricky, so I'll show you some good steps to take in order to ensure that your printed worksheet looks good. So let's talk about spreadsheets in uh, generally first, so we understand what Excel is doing. So the work area in Excel is a blank worksheet. Okay, now the more generic term is a spreadsheet, but when we're using Excel, we call it a worksheet, and it's laid out in a grid. And Excel worksheets are saved in a file known as a workbook. Okay, so kind of like how Microsoft Word calls their files documents or .doc, .doc, Excel calls their files workbooks. All right, and you can one workbook can be made up of one or more worksheets, so we can create several worksheets in one workbook. Now, using columns and rows, which we'll look at more closely in just a second, we enter information, okay, all types of data, and then we often perform calculations on that information. So, on a more basic level, Excel is just a great organizational tool for organizing your data. But really what we use Excel for in most cases is for those automatic mathematical calculations that are built into the program. After we complete those calculations, we format our worksheet, make sure it looks good, looks presentable, and then we can print it. And like I said, it can be a bit tricky to print from Excel, so we'll go over some good steps to take to ensure that the printed copy looks good. Now, up here is an up uh, close look at an Excel worksheet. As I said, it's laid out in a grid style. So we have our rows and we have our columns. The rows run horizontally across the page. The columns run vertically up and down the page. And as you can see, um, the rows are identified by number, where I'm circling right now, and the columns are identified by letter. Now, where those columns and rows intersect, where they meet, is where we have a cell. So each of those little rectangles in the grid is called a cell. And the active cell is the cell that you're working on. All right, you're entering data into it or maybe you're formatting it in some way to change the way it looks a little bit. All right, but in this case, that would be the active cell. Now, what's really important uh, to remember here, and we'll go over this again, is that when we identify cells, we always identify them by the column letter followed by the row number. So this would be called the A1 cell. Okay, this would be A2, this would be B2, B3, C3, C4, et cetera. Okay, we always refer to cells by, in, by that convention, the column letter followed by the row number. There's a reason for that, and we'll come to that in a few minutes. Now, before we talk about what we put into the worksheet, let's talk about what we see when we are kind of navigating through the worksheet. So as we move our mouse around, as we shake the mouse or wave the mouse around on the screen, we'll see a few different cursors pop up depending on what we're pointing at. So the one we're gonna see most often is the select cursor. This first one at the top here, which looks like a big white plus sign, uh, excuse me, a white plus sign. All right, we use that cursor to select a cell or a range of cells. And by a range, I just mean multiple cells at the same time. Typically we're doing that to format them in some way. Okay, maybe we wanna fill them in with a color, for example. 
um, we often do that to incorporate them into a calculation as well. Okay, but again, it's called the select cursor because we are selecting a cell. Now the one underneath is the fill handle. This is a black plus sign. We have a white plus sign, a black plus sign. Now the fill handle we only see when we point at the bottom right corner of our selection. So it's easier to see up here where I'm circling. There's a little, you'll see a little box in the bottom right hand corner of the cell. When you point at that box, you will get a fill handle. All right, even if a range of cells is selected, let's say we have 100 cells selected, in the bottom right corner of that selection, you will see a little box, and if you point at it, you will get the fill handle. Now, the fill handle copies formulas, by, by formulas I mean calculations, or values, and it pastes them into other cells, okay? So, don't worry too much about what, what all that means right now, because we will see that in action as we go through. Just uh, the, the best distinction you can make at this point is that the fill handle grabs the contents of the cell, the select cursor grabs the cell itself. All right, two different things. You have the cell, and then you have the contents inside the cell, or what we typically call the data value, okay? Now, underneath that, we have our I-beam here, which we've probably seen before. That just means when we see that, we are able to enter or edit data. All right, we, we see the I-beam when we're inside of the cell. And you'll also see the blinking insertion point when you're inside the cell. Of course, it's not blinking right now because this is a slide, uh, but you will see an insertion point and the I-beam, both indications that you are able to type and edit data as well inside of a cell. Last but not least, we have the two-headed arrow. We have the horizontal here, and down here is the vertical. We see those when we need to resize columns and rows. All right, as we enter data into cells, um, the, the cells, or should I say the columns and rows, they don't resize automatically. We have to do it ourselves. And um, at some point, I will show you how that works. It's very simple to do. Make sure I'm erasing. Now, what kinds of information, what kinds of data can we put into a cell? Well, we have text data. Now, text data, um, not always, but they often act as labels, all right? So, and by labels, I mean that we're using them to identify the values in other cells. So this is pretty simple. If you can imagine a vertical column made up of, of employee ID numbers, all right? If I show that to somebody, they may not understand what those are unless in the very top row, there's a text label that says employee ID number. So in that case, that would be a text data value that's acting as a label and identifying cells underneath of it. All right, it helps us make sense of the data. Of course, we can also have number data or numerical data. These would be, these are typically just specified values that we are entering ourselves. Okay, so we're just typing that in. We're, um, we're keeping track of what we sold today, right? I sold 15 of this, I sold 25 of this, 30 of that. Typically, these are just data values that we are entering ourselves. Now, once we have all that data entered, text and, and numerical, we can then put a formula into a cell, which, was a, which is a mathematical equation that incorporates our data into some kind of calculation. So it might be adding up all of those numerical values that I just talked about. It might be averaging them, it might be multiplying them, all right? And keep in mind, you can incorporate text data into a formula as well, not just numbers. For example, if I need to count how many times someone's name appears in my spreadsheet, okay, there's a formula that will do that for me. Okay, so formulas, they are kind of at the heart of Excel. That's what we use Excel for mostly. And there are a whole lot of formulas ranging from very simple to very complex. Now, formulas in Excel must begin with the equal sign. So in some cases, we kind of let Excel build the formula for us. In other cases, we do it ourselves. It kind of depends on what the, uh, what kind of math we're doing. Okay, sometimes one will be faster than the other. But in either case, you will see that the formula begins with the equal sign no matter what. So when we type an equation, 
we do not type in the data. We enter the cell reference where the data is stored. Remember what I said before about the difference between the cell and the contents inside the cell. Then when we change the data in any cell, the equation will be updated automatically upon the change or entry of any data that is referenced in the equation. What does all this mean? Let's break it down. So here we have an up, another zoomed in look at an Excel worksheet. And let's just say that these are rows one, two, and three here. Keep it simple. So we have rows one, two, three, columns D and E. So we can tell that this person is entering a formula into cell E3 because I see an equal sign. Now that person wants to add up those two values, three and two, okay? So the resulting formula is going to say equals three plus two. No, it's going to say equals E1 plus E2, okay, like you see down here, equals E1 plus E2. All right, and we do that because the formula will automatically update the answer if the data in cells E1 and E2 change. All right, let me just add those row numbers back again real quick one, two, and three. So like I said before about the naming conventions, remember we always refer to a cell by the column letter followed by the row number. So your row numbers and your column letters, they are constants, they cannot and do not change. What does change is your data inside the cells, all right? Data often changes over time, especially if we're keeping track of things in real time. So by using the cell names, like we see up here, Anytime we change the data values, it will just update the formula and its resulting answer automatically. So there's nothing else that we need to do once we put it in place. So if I go to cell E1 and I have to change this three to a six, the answer in cell E3 will be updated automatically and instantaneously to an eight because whatever's in cell E1 and whatever is in cell E2 is going to dictate this answer. And as you can see, by the way, when we put a formula into a cell, the cell is going to show us the answer the formula produces. All right, the formula is gonna be up top of what's called a formula bar. And again, we'll see that in a few minutes. So let's just do one more example here to drive this home. Oops, I didn't mean to bring that up. So here we have two tables side by side. The one on the left, we'll call that our original data set. The one on the right is our updated data set. Now, first let's look at the way this is organized. Okay, looks like we're keeping track of how many CDs we sold in our store. All right, and how much we sold them for total cost. And you'll notice that in row one, we've set up labels, text labels. They really serve no other purpose other than to identify the cells or the values underneath. Okay, now let's talk about the formula. So in this data set on the left, we have three formulas going on at the same time. The first formula is located in cell B6 here, which is adding up the values B2 through B5. The second formula is in cell D2 up here, which is multiplying the values in column B by the values in column C. So in this case, they're going left to right. And that formula has been applied to these three rows. Last but not least, we have a third and final formula going on in cell D6 here, which is adding up the values D2 through D5. Now, <clears throat> over here in our updated data set, We've changed one of the values. Cell B2 was changed from 15 to 30. Okay, let me just erase all those drawings so it's not so cluttered. So any formula that references that cell B2 is the answer to that formula is gonna update automatically once we change that number. So that's why you see B6, D2, and D6. All those answers have updated to their new, to their new answers, excuse me. Because, of, because they all reference cell B2. So spreadsheets allow you to organize information in tables. Like I said, at its most basic level, Excel is just a really good organizational tool. 
Excel provides the added bonus of automatic mathematics, and it will keep track of the data you place in cells. And if you define cells to refer to each other, which is what we've just been talking about with cell references, any changes made in one cell will be reflected in the referring cells. One last thing I want to show you are just your simple mathematical operators or operation symbols that you'll find on your keyboard. So if you ever need to do um, a, a, a formula manually, okay, which we often do, these four symbols are on your keyboard, multiplication, division, addition, and subtraction. If you want to use the numerical keypad on the right side of the keyboard, that's totally fine, of course, and you'll see all four of those symbols are right there on the numerical keypad. Just make sure the number lock key is turned on. It, it will light up to indicate that it's turned on. Otherwise, if you don't want to use that keypad or you don't have one, of course, we could use the numbers at the top of the keyboard and those same symbols are scattered throughout. I will let you know where they are if we need them. All right, so let's get into the fun part. Well, almost the fun part. Let's get into Excel. So I'm going to come down. Um, so for those of you here in person, you have access to Excel in your Windows 10 taskbar down here. There's that green and white X at the bottom of the screen. Click on it to launch Excel. At the bottom of the screen, on the screen. And of course, for those of you attending virtually, if you're doing this at the same time as I am, just launch Excel from whatever access point you're used to. All right, so when we launch Excel, um, just like other Office programs like Word, Publisher, and PowerPoint, the first screen we come to is what's called the Start screen. All right, now Excel includes a number of templates. If you're not familiar with templates, they are uh, ready-made, pre-designed specific types of a file. In the case of Excel here, we have uh, pre-designed or ready-made types of worksheets on the right here. This is called our template gallery. All right, so if you, um, all these templates are organized by different categories, some of which you'll see across the top here, okay? like business, personal, planners and trackers, list budgets, etc. You could click on one of these, you'll get a number of templates based on that category. All you would have to do is erase the generic data that's there and put in your own data. Everything else is already built, charts and graphs, tables, etc. All right. Now, some of that's a little more advanced, but you could always kind of play around with those when you're practicing to see how they work. Okay. Uh, budgets is a really good example, too, because a lot of people want to put together their own budgets. So Excel has a lot of budgets that um, you could use that are already uh, built. OK, and when you come to this screen on the right side, you'll see more categories on the in the scrollable list here on the right. So again, um, not something we're going to use in this class, but I do encourage you to check out those templates when you have a chance. So I'm going to go back to the start screen. I'll do that by going up to the upper left hand corner and clicking on the back arrow. All right, now on the left side of the start screen, we have a list of recent files. Again, you'll see this in all the other Office programs. In this case, these are recent workbooks that we've created and saved in Excel. Mine is currently empty because I wiped mine out because we're starting a new month here. All right, but as we go, as we save our work in our Excel classes, you'll see them start to fill in on the left there. All right, so I'm gonna start a new workbook now by going to the right side. And we're all gonna click on the very first template that says blank workbook. All right, so here we are, we're looking at an Excel spreadsheet, uh, worksheet, excuse me. So I'm just, I'm gonna go ahead and zoom in on mine. You don't have to on yours. This is just so you can see mine much better, especially for those of you here in person who are a bit far away. Okay, so um, just like we looked at in the initial uh, lecture, we have our vertical columns identified by letter and our horizontal rows, oops, identified by number. And where those columns and rows intersect, is where we have our cell. 
So right now the A1 cell is the active cell. How do I know? Because it has that nice green outline around it. Okay, and the letter A and the number one are both shaded in to indicate that that's the active cell. All right, and by the way, when, uh, when you start a new blank workbook, like we just said, Excel gives you one blank worksheet. You can create more, but it gives you one to start with. And we'll, we'll come to um, multiple worksheets in just a few minutes. So that's what we have here, just one worksheet. Now, when we enter data into a cell, it's very simple. As long as the cell is selected, you can just type right into it, okay? Um, and, and again, don't worry, we're going to do more formal exercises in just a minute so you get comfortable with that. But as long as the cell is selected, you just start typing and you enter data into the cell. And then we move on to our next cell, either by clicking with our select cursor, okay, this white plus sign I'm waving around, or by using our keyboard. You can use your mouse or your keyboard to go to the next cell. Again, we'll do that in a few minutes. Now, another thing that we use the select cursor for um, is to select cells, which I, um, in order to format them in many cases. So with a click and drag, you can select a range of cells like this. Okay, again, click and drag, just like highlighting text in Microsoft Word, same method. You can select multiple cells by clicking and dragging. Now, in this case, so this is called the A1 cell, but what would we call this? Okay, this is a range. We would call this the A1 through D5 range. All right, whenever you select a range of cells and you need to identify that range, you start with the cell in the top left corner and end with the cell in the bottom right corner. So this would be A1 through D5. All right, and if we were to type that in, we would indicate that with a colon, A1 colon D5. Okay, now on the right side of your worksheet, there's a vertical scroll bar to go up and down. And on the bottom right, there's a horizontal scroll bar here to scroll left and right through the worksheet. Okay, you can fit a lot of data into one worksheet. And I do mean a lot. Okay, more you can fit more data in one worksheet probably than you would ever need. And if you keep going to the right past column Z, by the way, the letters just start to double up. So you'll get A, 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 B, A, C, and then B, 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 C, et cetera. So you can keep going past column Z as well. Now, one little thing I always like to point out, because this happens all the time, as we scroll, okay, or as we enter data and the sheet starts to scroll by itself, just be careful because um, you will, other rows and columns will be out of your view. So if I say to you, click on your A1 cell, instinctively you just click here and you go, great. But if you look, I'm actually on the B6 uh, cell. That's because I scroll down and I scroll to the right. So those other rows and columns are out of my view. So just be careful and occasionally if you have to, just scroll accordingly to get back to where you need. Now let's talk about, um, let's go underneath the worksheet real quick. We see this little sheet one tab. I'll circle it here. Okay, sheet one. So this is where you go to create more worksheets if needed. So I'll show you an example here on my screen. If I click on the plus sign, I'll get a sheet two. If I click on the plus sign again, I get a sheet three, et cetera, et cetera. And I can toggle back and forth between all these sheets to manage my data. All right, this is very beneficial because it allows us to kind of create uh, or keep related sets of data in one file. So for example, sheet one might be expenses, sheet two might be profits. I don't have to keep them in two separate files. They're all in the same file, but separated by two different sheets. Okay, another common use is months of the year. Your January stats are in sheet one, February in sheet two. So you're separating them by sheet month to month. All right, and you can rename the tabs Okay, you can delete them. Um, the easiest way to do that stuff is with your right click. If you right click on any of these tabs, you'll get a menu. Okay, so for example, if you happen to create a couple more sheets when I did them and you want to delete the actual ones now, I'm going to right click on sheet three and click delete. And I'll right click on sheet two and click delete there as well. All right, we'll talk about more about kind of um, what we could do with these sheets later on um, in Excel 3. But for now, I just want to show you that you can create additional ones 
and you can manage them in a, in a few different ways, again, using that menu. Now I'm back to just one sheet, which is sheet one. Now let's go above the work area to talk about the menu above. And this is the kind of the hardest part, I think, to get used to in terms of, um, you know, kind of remembering how to use Excel is basically just memorizing this menu to the best of your ability. So when we use Microsoft Office 2007 or later, we always call this menu the ribbon. All right, this is called the ribbon. Now the ribbon is organized by a series of tabs, beginning with the home tab. So if you look up there, you'll see the home tab. It's already selected. There's a little, it's kind of like, um, there's a tab around it, okay? Now I'm gonna start clicking on the other tabs. So that's home, we have an insert tab, page layout, formulas, data, review, view, and help. So as you see, when you click on a tab, you get a different set of tools for each tab. Don't worry about the Acrobat tab that I have on my screen. That's something extra on my computer. Just pretend it's not there, okay? And again, this is the same uh, organizational system as all the other Office uh, or the other the other big Office programs, Word, Publisher, and PowerPoint. Uh, of course, the tools are different, but the the menu is the sort of the way the menu is designed is the exact same. All right. Now I'm going to go back and click on the Home tab. Now within each tab, okay, each tab is further broken down into more specific categories, which are listed at the bottom of that tab left to right. So right now I'm in the home tab. These are called groups, all right? So in the home tab, for example, I have a clipboard group, a font group, alignment group, number, styles, cells, and editing group. So those groups are there to help you narrow down the tool you need. All right, and the home tab, think of it as your home base. You really don't need to leave the home tab too often to build a simple yet effective worksheet. All right, so you'll find that um, really for today, we're gonna be in the home tab uh, pretty much the whole time. <clears throat> All right, now I wanna point this out as well. In many of these groups, you'll see that little arrow in the bottom right-hand corner. Okay, that's called the dialog box launcher. That's something we could use in some cases to get to extra tools that are not in the ribbon itself. So I'll use the number group as a quick example. If I click on that arrow, it's going to, just as the name says, launch a dialog box. All right, now the dialog box essentially does two things. It's going to include the same tools that are in that group, but instead of using icons, it lays them out in a plain text format. So sometimes these are a bit easier to use to find the tool you need. Also, they often contain extra tools that are not in the ribbon at all. So sometimes we prefer to use these, sometimes we have to use these. At the moment, however, I don't need it at all, so I'll go on the bottom and click on Cancel. All right, a couple more things, and I promise we're gonna get started building our worksheet. In the top left corner, above the Home tab there, where I'm circling, in the very, very top left corner is your Quick Access Toolbar. You'll see a, a few icons up there, starting with your Save Disk. Okay, um, your quick access toolbar is there to allow you to add additional access points to your favorite commands or favorite tools so you can get to them faster. <clears throat> All right, so to do that, you go to the very right, you'll see the little icon for more options, which is the triangle with the line over it. That will give you a preliminary list of some tools that you can add. But if you wanna to get to all of the, the commands in the ribbon, go down and click on more commands. And from this dialog box, you can add whatever tool you need or whatever command you need from the ribbon. And you can add more than one, you just have to do them one at a time. So select the tab which that command is found, select the specific command from this list, click add here, repeat that same process for each tool and then click OK at the bottom, and then they'll be available in your Quick Access toolbar. So this is good not just for Quick Access, it's also good um, in case you have trouble remembering where a certain tool is located, just add it to that toolbar, because it will always be right there. All right, last thing I wanna point out here is the formula bar. 
okay? Um, this is unique to Excel, of course. The formula bar displays the contents of a cell that is selected, but that's especially important for formulas because as I mentioned earlier in the lecture, when we enter a formula into a cell and then we press enter, the cell is gonna show us the answer. But if we forget how the formula is spelled out, or we're just trying to verify whether there's a formula there at all, we look in the formula bar and that's where it's gonna show it to us. All right, the formula going on behind the scenes. All right, so without any further delay, let's go ahead and get started building a simple worksheet. All right, so um, in this class, we're gonna be pretending that we work for a candy factory. And we're going to be keeping track of how many of each candy is in each bag in front of us. All right, we're going to have a total of four bags, and we're going to have six piece, uh, six types of candy, and we're just going to identify them by their color. We're going to keep it simple. Now, so at this point, we should all be on the A1 cell. Make sure you see A1. All right, that's where we're going to start. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to set up a vertical uh, range of our colors. So let's just start with red. So type in R-E-D on your keyboard. Remember, as long as that cell is active, you can just start typing. All right, now I wanna go down to cell A2 for my next color. I can either click on it with my mouse or I can press the enter key on the keyboard. Okay, the enter key goes um, down a column, one cell at a time. The tab key, goes right across a row. So if you want to use your keyboard, it's enter and tab, or you could just click with your mouse. Either way is totally fine. So right now we're on the A2 cell. Here we're going to put green. Now I'm going to go down to cell A3, so I'll just press enter, or again, you could also click. It's up to you. In cell A3, I'm going to put in blue. I'll go down to A4 now, where we have orange. Down to A5, we have brown. And then down to A6, we have yellow. Don't worry too much about um, if you have a little typo, just skip the, um, really, at this point, just make sure the first letter in each color is correct because we will eventually sort, but don't worry too much about typos. Just get the values in there. All right, it's more important that you just focus on getting comfortable entering data and using your keyboard or mouse to navigate. All right, now I left my insertion point in cell A6 for a second. I did that on purpose. Um, it's always a good kind of habit when you're when you've entered your last value into a certain range. Like let's say we entered this and now we're going to move on to something else, but we're going to take a little break for a second. All right, we got this done. It's a good idea to just exit that cell anyway after your last value. So just click on any other cell. Okay. And I say that because a couple of reasons. Um, if you're still inside the cell, a lot of tools will not work. Notice how a lot of your ribbon is grayed out. Okay, so when you're inside of a cell, a lot of tools don't work. You also can't resize columns or rows. You can't zoom in. A number of things just don't work when you're inside of a cell. Also, sometimes we forget that we're still inside the cell and then we start adding more data and before you know it, we've made some mistake. All right, so just be careful. And I always think it's a good idea. Just exit the cell completely when you're done. Okay, also, I should mention too that um, I, I'm, I'm going to say 90% positive that Excel will not save anything that's, if you don't exit the cell, you're not actually kind of saving that as part of the new uh, file. Okay. So in, in other words, it's not going to add it to your file until you exit the cell. So that's another good reason to exit. 
All right, so we have our colors. Perfect. Now I'm just looking here real quick. All right, let's actually, let's sort now. We'll do, we're gonna do more complex sorting in other Excel classes. Let's just kind of understand what sorting is. So before I move on, I wanna take these colors and I want to sort them alphabetically. All right, in the real world, typically when we are organizing data, when we're organizing text data, we typically organize it alphabetically, right? Um, whether we're inventorying, cataloging, whatever we might be doing. So let's go ahead and sort this. Now, I don't need to, re-enter anything, okay, nothing like that. All I have to do is just let Excel take these values and rearrange them in alphabetical order ascending, right, A to Z. So the first step in sorting, again, we'll talk about this more in other Excel classes, but just select any cell in this range, A1 through A6. It doesn't matter if it's A1, A6, A4, just any one single cell in that range. And that's our way of telling Excel where to go to sort. Now in your home tab, over to the right in the editing group here, almost all the way to the right, you will see a tool called sort and filter. Let's click on sort and filter. Okay, click on it and you'll see on the drop down list, the very first one is sort A to Z, go ahead and click on it. And now they're sorted alphabetically. So remember, the row numbers didn't change. It's not like we have four, you know, five, one, anything like that. The row numbers stay the same, they're constants. The only thing that changed was the arrangement of the data values, what was inside the cells, all right? Now, one more thing. Um, another thing I like to point out, I like to get ahead of this too. All right, I've been doing these Excel classes uh, for quite a while now, so I see these um, little errors, common errors, so I, I like to get ahead of them. So you, you might run into this situation at some point. I'm gonna go ahead and sort A to Z. Okay, so looks like A2 through A6 are sorted correctly, but why is yellow at the top? Okay, because there's a space before the first character in yellow in that value. Okay, if you accidentally put a space before your value, which happens often, the, uh, your sort tool is gonna put it at the top or bottom, depending on how you sort. All right, so I would fix that by editing that data. Now, this is something we also didn't talk about yet. If I need to edit an existing data value, in this case, I will double click onto the cell, one, two, that puts me inside the cell. Now I can use my backspace key to erase that empty space. Now I'll exit the cell and then sort again. All right, so if you need to edit existing data in a cell, you can either double click and change it one character at a time with your keyboard, right? Backspace, delete key, whatever. You can also overwrite the contents of a cell entirely. So you can just type right over it as if you're typing into it for the first time. All right, everybody sorted correctly, we're all good? Okay, excellent. Now at this point, let's go ahead and save our work just in case um, something happens. We don't wanna, you know, uh, all of our hard work to be gone. So let's go to our file menu. So let's all go to our file menu, which is to the left of your home tab. All right, saving in Excel is just like saving in really any other program. All right, we're gonna to go to our file menu. Now, because this is the first time we're saving it, we're gonna to go to save as. But even if you click on save, it's still gonna take you to save as anyway, so no big deal. All right, now we're gonna select a folder. So let's just, um, let's go to this PC, click on that because we don't want to save it to our OneDrive account. And then we'll come down here and click on Browse. 
All right. So now, um, so Excel is going to automatically put you in your Windows Documents folder as a default, just like Word does. Um, really, all the Office programs do for basic files like this. Okay, and Macs will do the same thing. They'll put it in your Documents folder on a Mac. Um, so if you wanted to change that, of course, you could just select your folder of choice. Now, for those of you here in person, just keep it where it is. That's fine in your Documents folder. I'm going to put it in my folder called Class Samples here. And then now that we've selected a folder, let's go down to file name. It's going to say book one, which of course we want to change if that's way too generic. So just erase it. So just use your backspace key, erase. And we'll call it Excel One Practice. All right, so now that I've given this uh, a new name, Excel One Practice, I'm going to go ahead and click Save, and let's all save our work. And just ignore this message that I get. I'm just going to click Yes, and we're good. All right, so now we can move on. So the next thing I'd like to do is I, um, I need some labels. So we're pretending that I forgot to do this, okay? So typically when you set up a, an Excel worksheet, the first thing you'll probably do is set up your labels because you want to know what, what you're going to put where. All right. So for example, each of these colors belongs is we're keeping track of how many of each color are in each bag. So I'm going to need a new row above the current row one where I can put labels. Okay. The problem is, of course, row one is the top row. So how could we possibly have something above it? Well, Excel allows us to insert new columns and rows whenever we need to. And all it will do is just shift all the data values down to rows two through seven and give me a blank row one where we can put labels. So let's go ahead and do that. Now, when we insert a new row in Excel, here's the rule. The new row goes above the row that is currently selected. It goes above the row that is currently selected. So if I click on any cell in row four, if I insert a new row here, it's going to go between three and four because it's going to go above row four because that's what's selected. So if I need to put something above the current row one, I'm going to select any cell from the current row one. So just select any cell, A1, B1, C1, it doesn't matter as long as it's in row one. Now we're going to insert a new row and we'll do that. There's a few ways to do this. We're going to use the ribbon in your home tab over to the right in your cells group. You have your insert tool here. Now, don't click on the icon. That's only going to give you one cell. Click on the insert drop down. Good. And you'll see insert sheet rows. Click on that. And you'll get a new row one. And it shifts everything down A2 through A7, like I said. By the way, your cells group where we just went to the insert tool, that's also where you go to delete rows and columns. You'll see insert and you'll see delete. All right. So now A1 is the active cell again. At least if, if, if it's not, just make sure you click um, there so it's active. All right, let's put a label there. It's pretty self-explanatory, but just to be consistent, we'll call this color. So now we have a label identifying the values underneath of it. Now, I want to go over to cell B1 next to the right, so I can either click or use my tab key to do that. All right. 
So now we're going to put in the, our remaining labels. So now we're keeping track of the bags. Remember, we're keeping track of how many each colors in each bag. We have four bags. We're just going to call them bag one, bag two, bag three, and bag four. All right, but um, don't type it all in yet. Let's just start with B1 here. Type in bag one. So you're in cell B1. Type in bag one. All right, now I want to install C1, we're going to have bag two, D1, bag three, E1, bag four. However, I don't need to type all that in. All right, Excel um, has a great tool called autofill. All right, it will auto, in this case, it will autofill a series. By a series, I mean some kind of um, a predictable pattern, right? Consecutive numbers, maybe months of the year, days of the week. Okay, some kind of pattern we have in real life that Excel can detect and then fill in the blanks. So now we're going to come to that nice fill handle, the handy dandy fill handle. Before we get to autofill, let me just review the fill handle. So when we select the cell and we point at the bottom right hand corner, that little box, we get the black plus sign like this. Okay, we also remember it's not just one cell, if I have a whole range of cells. In the bottom right hand corner, we'll still have a little box and I'll get the fill handle. All right. Now, at its most basic level, the fill handle, you don't have to do this, just watch on my screen. It will just copy and paste values like so. Okay. It just so all I do is click and drag with that fill handle and it copies and pastes whatever value I selected. In the case of a series, however, it's going to just fill in the series for you instead of a direct copy and paste. So, Everybody select cell B1. Make sure you're not inside the cell. If you are, just click outside of it and click on it again. Now we're gonna go to the bottom right-hand corner, point at the little box, wait for the black plus sign. Once you see the black plus sign, click and drag over to E1, and you'll have back two, back three, and back four. And if you and if you drop it by accident, it's okay. Just pick up and finish where you left off. You could always just keep going as needed. You could also take away if you make too many. All right. So again, other patterns, other series such as months of uh, months of the year, days of the week. All right. And you could even in some cases do custom series, like um, if you want to establish every. Tuesday and Thursday, back and forth, Tuesday, Thursday for the, you know, for the month, Excel will pick up on that. There are ways to do that as well, or odd numbers, something along those lines. All right, everybody have bag one, two, three, and four. All right, we're looking good. So now that we've had those labels, let's go ahead and fill in the actual data. Okay, the number of color in each bag. So I'll move, um, what I'd like to do is uh, I'm going to do two at a time. I'll go down each column, B, then C, D, then, and then D, E. And I'll shout out two at a time. I'll give you a minute to catch up, and then we'll move on with adding to our worksheet. All right, so right now we should all be on cell B2 under bag one. All right, so again, I'm going to do two at a time. So B2, then B3. We're going to have nine, then seven. Okay, four, nine. Eight, six. And uh, as you can see, in a scenario like this, the enter key, using the enter key to go to the next cell is a bit faster. But if you want to use the mouse, again, that's totally fine. As you get more comfortable, you'll, you'll, I, I guarantee you'll start using the keyboard more because it does, you do move a bit faster through the worksheet. All right, so click on start on, make sure you're starting on cell B2 and just type it in nine.
All right, now I'm on cell C2 under bag two. We have six, then five. Remember, if you press enter after each number, you'll move a bit faster. Six, enter, five, enter. All right, um, nine, uh, I'm sorry, 12, nine, 12. And then eight, seven. Ah, I'm hitting the wrong key. Look what I'm doing. There we go. Oops. All right, I'm on cell D2 now under bag three, where we have seven, six. So seven, enter, six, enter. Nine, six, seven, five. All right, I'm gonna do bag four and then I'm gonna, I'll come around and make sure I, everyone is caught up. Bag four, um, so we're on cell E2. We have nine, seven, four, eight, eight, five. And, and remember, make sure you exit that last five down there just to be safe. All right, and for those of you who finished this part, you may as well go do a quick, do a quick save to update your workbook. So either go to file and click save here or just use the quick save icon in your quick access toolbar. Either one will do the same thing. Okay, so um, let's continue building onto our worksheet here. We're gonna add some data in, um, but we're gonna do that through calculations or formulas. So the first thing I wanna calculate is the number of, um, the total number of pieces of candy in each bag, regardless of color. So I basically wanna add up the colors. All right, so, um, so what does that mean here? What am I gonna be, what am I gonna be adding up? I'm gonna be adding up down the columns, right? So we're gonna, so for bag one, for example, we're gonna be adding B2 through B7 to give me an answer down here, wherever that answer might go. So now a quick thing to note with formulas, you do not need to put the formula directly adjacent to the, to the, um, the cells it's referencing, okay? I could put this formula anywhere in the sheet all the way down here in row 103. Okay, it doesn't really matter because all that matters is that you're referencing the right cells. But because of course I want you to see everything on the screen and because we might want to print our work, we're gonna keep everything right next to each other, okay? Now, 
the formula is going to go in cell B8 because it's going to be adding up these values here. But before I put in the formula, I should probably set up a label that identifies what the answers to that formula are. So in cell A8, so let's all click on A8 now. Just put in a label called total. All right, and then I'll just exit that cell. And here we are. So now we're going to put in a formula. So as I, I kind of mentioned this in the, in the initial lecture, when we use Excel, we have two choices. We can either type in the formula ourselves if we're familiar with how to do that, or we can kind of let Excel do it for us. So actually, in this case, um, let's let Excel do it for us first, and then we'll practice doing it manually. We're going to do it both ways. So when we let Excel do it, um, typically, we are using what's called a function. So let's let me talk about functions for one second. In Excel, um, it has what's called a function library, which includes a number of different calculations, ranging from very simple to very complex. Now, these are all built into the program. All you really need to do is select the cells that you want to include in whatever function it is, select the function, and then Excel does the rest. So you don't have to worry about how to how that would be spelled out mathematically, which can often be, often be difficult to do. Excel will just kind of do it for you. Okay, so there are basically two different places to find the functions in Excel. In your home tab over to the right in the editing group where we had sort and filter before, we have the auto sum tool. Now don't click on auto sum, Click on the drop down next to AutoSum. There's a little arrow there. Okay, you'll see a few functions. Now, these little names that we see, these funny names, sum, average, count numbers, these are functions. All right, so each function has its own name. The calculation is built into the name. If you go down to the bottom, you'll see more functions. If I click on more functions, it will open up a dialog box. That brings me to all the functions that Excel holds, all arranged by different categories here. Okay, financial, uh, math and trigonometry, lookup and reference, logical, engineering, et cetera. Like I said, from very simple to very, very advanced and complex. Now, if, if you have this open, just click on cancel in the bottom right-hand corner. Another place to find the functions is in your formulas tab up here in the ribbon. And you'll see right underneath is the function library group with the same categories, but using these icons instead. Okay, so again, two different places to access essentially the same thing, just all the different functions that Excel offers. And of course, we're gonna keep it simple, but I just wanted to show you where they're located in case you wanted to uh, you know, try some out. So I'm gonna go back to the home tab if you're not if you're still in the formulas tab, just click on the home tab so we're back in the same place. And let's go ahead and do this using the auto sum. So in this case, we're using the auto sum because if you're familiar with adding, okay, the answer after we add, we call that the sum, S-U-M, hence the auto sum tool that we need. So let's select our data first and then we'll use the function. So click on B2 and select down through B7. And you, remember, don't use the fill handle. Uh, no, start with B2, we don't need bag one here. Yeah, we're not including that in the calculation. So B2 through B7. And like I said, if you end up with a bunch of nines, which I see all the time, it's because you use the fill handle. All right, use your select cursor, the white plus sign. Again, start with B2, click and drag down to B7. And I should have mentioned, I, I apologize for not mentioning this sooner, that Excel does have an undo tool, just like Word does. In your quick access toolbar, there's that left turning arrow. So if you make a mistake, just click undo and it will put you back to where you were. And you're probably like, why didn't you mention that earlier? That would have come in handy. Sorry about that.
All right, now that we have our data selected, let's select the function that we want to put that data into. That's going to be auto sum. This one's very easy. All we have to do is go to our home tab to the editing group, click right on auto sum. And you'll see in cell B8, it's going to put your answer. Or I should say it's going to put the formula and the resulting answer of 43. Click right on auto sum. All right, good. All right, now, in cell B8, remember, what is in that cell? Is it a 43? Kind of, but not really. What really is in that cell is a formula producing the answer of 43. How do I know that? Because if I look in the formula bar, it shows me the formula that's going on behind the scenes. It might look a little weird, the way that's spelled out. We'll, we'll break that down in just a minute. Okay, but that's the formula going on behind the scenes in that cell. And Remember, uh, you don't have to do this, just watch for one second. The beauty of how this works using the cell names, B2 through B7, is that if I go to cell B2 and change this 9 to a 99, it's going to update automatically to the new answer, as you just saw. Okay. <clears throat> so um, let's, uh, let's do it manually first, and then we're going to apply it to the other bags. So let me double click on this cell. You'll see the formula better. Just if if you double click on the cell, be very careful. You don't want to type into it. All right. You might just want to watch for this part. So this is the formula. Equals sum B2 through B7. Remember, I told you that that's how we type out a range with the colon. Okay. So all Excel functions, regardless of how simple or complex they are, they use the same uh, we call this the syntax, the way it's spelled out, the order of these characters. All right. The first thing is the equal sign. That's always the case. Equal sign first. Next to the equal sign is the function name, sum. When we use a function name, which we don't always have to, but when we use a function, the cell range must be enclosed in parentheses. That's why you see parentheses there. Okay. And then the colon indicates a range. Now, another benefit to using a function, other than the fact that Excel does the work for us, is that if I didn't use a function here, all right, the way I would have had to do this was to say B2 plus B3, oops, I'm using minus, uh, plus B3 plus B4, et cetera, which is much more time consuming. All right, so imagine if I had 100 values, that would take forever. But by using a function, I establish a cell range, which is much quicker to do because all I'm doing is clicking and dragging with my mouse. All right, so let me just put that back the way it was real quick. Give me one second. There we go, okay. So if you wanna practice doing it manually, click on cell B8 and just press delete on your keyboard to delete that formula. Okay, if you, you don't have to, but if you wanna practice doing it manually, delete it. And by the way, to delete the contents of any cell, that's the fastest way to do it. Just select the cell and press delete. So now I'm going to do it. I'm going to type it out myself. So B8 is selected. What's the first thing we need? Equal sign key, which is to the left of your backspace key. The next thing we need is the, the function name, which was sum. So you can just type out SUM. It doesn't need to be all caps. Lowercase is fine. Then, I need my, then the next thing I need is my cell range. So, if, but first I need the parentheses. So shift nine for the left parentheses. The first cell in my range is B2. I can either click on it or just, I prefer to just type it in. I think it's easier. So there we go. Next, I need a colon. All right, the colon is to the right of the letter L on the keyboard. You just need the shift key to get it. And then the last cell in the range is B7. And then I need the right parentheses, shift zero. I press enter and there it is. All 
All right, so again, that's that convention, right? That syntax is the way even the more complex functions work. And you can combine functions too. Okay, we can nest functions. It gets very, very complicated, but it is possible to do that. All right, any questions on the function aspect that we just covered? Does that make sense? All right, so it has two, two benefits. Excel does the work, and it saves us from having to input individual data of cell values. All right, we just establish a range. Yes, yep, so if you're gonna do it manually, yes, there is that that syntax. The, the, the order of the characters must be the same. Yeah, that's how Excel knows what to do. <clears throat> All right, and there are other characters that come into play sometimes, just not in this case, but this is kind of the most basic of what you'll see with other functions. All right, so now we want to take this formula and apply it to the other bags, two, three, and four. All right, once again, I don't need to do it individually, we could use that handy dandy fill handle because remember it copies and pastes not only values but formulas as well. So select cell B8 where the formula is located. Go to the bottom right hand corner of that cell, point at the little box, get your black plus sign. Click and drag over to cell E8. And there you go, you should have 43, 47, 40, and 41. All right, so basically what it does is it just, um, it just matches the references according to the, in this case, the column. So this was B2 to B7, so it just, so Excel says, okay, so this one will be C2 to C7, D2 to D7, et cetera. All right, very simple. Now, after all the hard work, let's save our workbook, do a quick save. Remember, either use, click on the save disk in your quick access toolbar, or go to file and click on save here. All right, let's do another one real quick. Let's do an average. I want to average now the number of each color, the average number of blues across all four bags and our average number of browns, etc. So in this case, we're working which direction? Right, horizontally left to right. So we'll set up our formula in column F to the right here. Okay, before we do that, let's set up a label that identifies what the answers to those formulas are. So in cell F1, click on it. We'll just type in a label called average. Now just go down to cell F2 for a second. All right, so here's another good case for a function. All right, um, some of us, you know, the uh, typing out uh, an average calculation might take a, we might kind of forget how that works, all right? But you know, essentially the average would be adding up these numbers, then dividing them by four, right? But you know, parentheses come into play. All you know, if you remember the order of operations from math, all that kind of stuff comes into play in Excel. So instead of having to worry about all that, let's just let Excel do it for us. So there is a, a there is a function called average, but before we do that, let's select our data values first. So start with B2 click and drag over to E2. And this, so what we're doing right now is selecting the cell range that we want to incorporate into the function. Left to right, B2 over to E2. Now, back up to the home tab, over to the editing group, Click on the auto sum drop down this time, the actual arrow, not the auto sum tool itself, and select average, which is the second function listed. And there's our answer of 7.75. Click on the drop down next to auto sum and select average. Perfect.
All right, so now we want to take that formula, apply it to the other rows, and we'll include the total row, row eight, because we can get an average uh, total, basically. So let's select cell F2, go to the bottom right-hand corner. This case, you do want the fill handle because we are copying and pasting and applying. So get your black plus sign, click and drag down to F8, let go. And now we've applied the average function to the other ranges. All right, and as you can see, there's that syntax. Same exact, the syntax is the same, the way it's spelled out. The only difference is the name of the function, in this case, average. All right. Good, let's save our work. All right. Okay, so now our math is complete. Now let's do some formatting. Okay, let's dress this up a little bit. So, um, the first thing I want to do is I don't like these decimals. I want them to be whole numbers instead. So 7.75, I want that to be an eight. 6.25 should be a six, etc. I want them to be rounded up or down to the nearest whole number. So in Excel, uh, we do not have to change these ourselves. We can, through the use of formatting commands, just let Excel change the formatting of the number. All right, Excel supports many different types of numbering formats, not just whole numbers. It does other, you know, it does decimals, currency, um, percentages, etc. All right, so um, your number formats, these are pretty easy to find. In your home tab, you have your number group. That's where you're going to find them. But before we select from there, before we do anything, we need to select the, the cells upon which we want to apply that formatting command. So I'm going to select F2 through F8. Remember, don't use the fill handle, just your normal select cursor, the white plus sign. Now we're going to go up to the number group. Now there are a few different ways to do this. Okay. Um, Perhaps the easiest way in this case to just get a whole number, you have your decrease, I'm sorry, your increase and your decrease decimal tools here. Notice, see the left arrow and the right arrow? Okay. If you click on decrease decimal one, two times, it will just round it up or down to the nearest whole number. So just click on decrease decimal twice, boom, boom, and you'll have whole numbers. All right, let's do, I'm gonna do another quick save. Now, the next thing I wanna do is I wanna give this a title. All right, we're gonna give our, uh, our data range a title. Now, I wanna put the title above the data range, but we had a similar problem we had earlier, which was that our top row is already being used. So once again, we need to insert a new row and into that new row, I will put a title. So remember the rule, when we insert a new row, the new row goes above the row that is currently selected. So select any cell from row one, doesn't matter which one it is. Go up to your home tab, over to the cells group, go to the insert drop down, and select insert sheet rows. Insert sheet rows, the second from the top. All right, now, um, an important little note here, by doing that, we also updated all of our cell references. What was B2 through B7 is now B3 through B8, because everything was shifted down, right? So 
just keep in mind, if you add new rows and columns, once formulas are in place, typically you don't have to worry because Excel will just update your cell references automatically. So no, nothing got corrupted there. All right, so now we're gonna go to that top row and we're gonna do our title. All right, now another problem we have is if I wanna center this title above my data, that's gonna be impossible because I have a bunch of individual cells with boundaries or barriers in between. Okay, so I can't possibly center anything perfectly unless I do what's called merging the cells. All right, Excel allows us to merge a number of cells into one big cell without any divisions in between. So, um, the first step is to select the cells that you want to merge. So once again, we're not using the fill handle. Your normal select cursor, select A1 through F1, like this. Because we want to merge those cells together into one big cell. Now we're going to go up to our home tab, to our alignment group, okay? where there's a tool called merge and center. And I wanna point out um, basic formatting, like things we find in Microsoft Word, adjusting your font size, font type, uh, left center and right alignment. Those are all supported here in Excel in their font group and your alignment group respectively. So you'll find a lot of this, those same basic formatting commands here in Excel. But let me get back to merging. So in the alignment group, we have the merge and center tool right here. Click right on it. Go ahead and click it. All right, and you'll see that it merges those cells together. And if you double click into it, your cursor is centered. So it does both things at the same time. It merges the cells and centers your cursor. So now I could just go ahead and type in the title. We'll call it Candy Factory Data. And then I'll just exit the cell for now. Just I'll click outside of it and I'll do a quick save. All right, and like I said, just make sure you click outside the cell when you're done to for, just to exit the cell for now. So we make sure that all that's gonna be saved in there correctly. All right, now I wanna just for, do a little bit more formatting. The first thing I'd like to do is dress up the title a little bit. So um, for the title, I just wanna maybe give it a different color, maybe change the size of the font, just a couple of quick things just to emphasize the title a bit, draw a little more attention to it. So go back to that title and click on it, that title cell. Now in Excel, you do not need to, like in Microsoft Word, I would have to select the text itself, right? If I wanna format the text. In this case though, if you select the cell itself, anything, any of the contents in that cell will be formatted the same way. So if I change the font size, it's gonna change the font size for all the contents. I don't have to select the contents themselves. Does that make sense? So just by selecting the cell, everything's impacted inside of it. So I've selected my title cell. I'm gonna go up to the font group. I'm gonna to go to the font size where it says 11. I'll click on the drop down and I'll just make it a little bit bigger. I'll make it 14.
All right, I'll go right next door to the font itself where it says Calibri. I'll click on that drop down. You could choose whatever one you want, really, if you if there's one you like from the, the list. I'm going to go with the one called Bauhaus 93, B-A-U-H-A-U-S. It looks like this. Any font is fine. All right, and last but not least, also in the font group, you have your fill color. All right, you'll see the paint bucket there. That's your fill color. Click on the drop down next to that bucket for more color choices. And I'll just select something from this palette to fill in that title cell with a color. All right, and the icon next to the fill tool is your font color. So if you want to change, if you ever want to change the color of the font, that's where you go. All right, but I'm just going to leave it like this. Last but not least, something that I like to do myself, and you'll see this often in um, other other uh, Excel workbooks or worksheets. Uh, I like to offset my labels. So in other words, I like to kind of format my labels a bit differently than the other values, just to make sure that whoever's reading this knows that these are labels and everything else, those are unique values. All right, so I'm gonna first select cells A2 through F2. Remember, don't use your fill handle. If you end up with a bunch of color, it's because you use the fill handle. So just use your select cursor, A2 to F2. And we'll do three things here. I'll go up to the font group. I'm gonna click on the B for bold. I'm going to go to the fill color again, but choose a different color this time. Remember that paint bucket? And then I'm going to go over to the alignment group next door, where you have your left center and right alignment options, just like you do in Word. And I'll click on center alignment. And you'll notice that it takes the contents and centers them horizontally in the cell. Again, here is left, here's center. Now you might be thinking, wait a minute, we have one more label, A9, where it says total. Shouldn't this look like the other labels? Yes, it should. All right. Who here is familiar with Format Painter? Okay. Format Painter is a really awesome tool that's in all the Office programs. I, I believe it is anyway. Um, it's been around forever. Um, a lot of people don't realize it exists. So. In your home tab in your clipboard group, you have your cut, copy, and paste. You also have a tool called Format Painter. Think of Format Painter as copying and pasting the formatting options of something onto another something else. In this case, the formatting options in one cell onto another cell. So if I want to take A9 here and make it um, a bold font, a blue fill color, and center alignment, I don't have to do all that again. I just select any cell that has those options already in place. So I'll click on A2, click on A2 or B2 or C2, whatever. All right, and then go up and click on Format Painter in your clipboard group. Now, when you bring your mouse pointer, you'll see a little paintbrush next to it. Click on cell A9, and there you go. All right, and if you ever want to keep using Format Painter, keep applying it to more, because um, you'll notice it turns off immediately after you click on one thing. If you want to keep using it, you can double click it. It will stay on. And then when you're finished, click on it to turn it off.
All right. Let's do a quick save to update our workbook. All right, now let's talk about printing our work. So let me show you, you don't have to do this on your end, just look at my screen for a second. I'm gonna go to print preview and let's see how this will look if I don't make any changes to the printed uh, copy. All right, so a few things. Um, first of all, Excel, uh, at least in my experience, Excel worksheets tend to print out better if they're in landscape orientation. If you're not familiar, when we print documents, typically they're either in portrait or landscape. Portrait is when is like this when it's arranged. The page is arranged vertically. The long sides are on the left and right. But we can also print in landscape. We're just going to flip it over so the long edges are on the top and bottom. All right. Again, I just find that Excel worksheets tend to print better in landscape, so we're going to change that. Another thing, um, we have a lot of room on this. Notice it's only printing out the range. By the way, it's not printing out any empty cells. Excel will do that automatically but we have a lot of room, so we could probably blow this up a little bit, make it a little bit bigger. So we'll do that. We don't need to increase our font size. We'll just increase the scale or the scaling, all right? which is something we can do in our page setup. So we're gonna make it a little bit bigger. Also, I don't like the way it's in the top left corner. I want it to be centered on the page horizontally and vertically, so we're gonna fix that. Um, we're also gonna quickly add a header and footer. I'll explain what those are when we get there. And last but not least, for some reason, it doesn't print out the grid lines as a default. I think it should, but it doesn't. Um, by grid lines, I mean the, the actual lines that are separating one cell from the next, which I find make it easier to kind of read your data. So we're gonna add the grid lines to the printed copy. All right, so all of these things are gonna be done in our page layout tab. So now we're gonna leave the home tab. Let's go to the page layout tab. All right, so we have our, in our page layout tab, we have our page setup uh, group here. All right, so we can um, pretty much accomplish everything we just talked about here. So let's start with um, orientation. Under orientation, we can change it to landscape. So click on orientation and then select landscape. Okay, now um, to increase the scale, we need to come over here. We need to leave the page setup group for a second and go to scale to fit. This group, you'll see scale 100%. All right, um, you can either type into the box itself or just use the up and down arrows, make it 150%. All right, now in kind of real life, adjusting the scale can takes a bit of trial and error. In other words, you have to look at your print preview, make sure it's not too big where it's on two pages now, or make sure it's not too small where you can't read it. Um, I just happen to know that 150 works because I've done this before. But again, in kind of in real life, when you're doing this yourself, adjusting your scale can take a bit of trial and error. So go up a little bit, look at the print preview. If it's too much, bring it back down or keep going if needed. All right, just go back and forth between this and the print preview to see how it looks. But now we have it set to 150, so we're good. now. Um, let's go back over to the page setup group. Um, uh, this one, okay, so we want to center it on the page. So let's go to margins. But we have to go down here to custom margins. And in this dialog box, check off both boxes. We're down where it says center on page. Do we all see that? All right, check off both boxes horizontally and vertically. And click OK. All right, now we're gonna go over to um, this group called Sheet Options, and you'll see grid lines. So right now, the view is turned on, which means I can see them on the screen, but print is not turned on, so check off the box for print. 
and that will print out the grid lines. And I'm just trying to see. There's no, okay, we have to go to our insert tab. All right, now, last thing I wanna do is I wanna give this a header and footer. So we, um, for, well, for one thing, is if, you, if you print your work, I know whose is whose, but also it's good to practice this. So let's go to our insert tab, okay? Now, um, I won't go into too much detail. If you plan on taking Word 2 with me, what is that, this week? Um, I'll talk about headers and footers in a bit more detail, but, um, basically, in a, in a document, whether it's Microsoft Word, Excel, okay, Publisher, you have your margins of the page, those empty spaces on the top, bottom, left, and right. A header allows you to put information to, into the top margin, and a footer allows you to put information into the bottom margin. We usually use headers and footers for identifying information. So what I mean by that is information like the author of the file or the workbook, um, the date in which it was created, a page number, all right, things that don't have to do with the actual content, more to do with who created it, when, and how it's arranged, all right? So that's what we use headers and footers for. So in our insert tab, over to the right, <clears throat> excuse me, we have our text group. Let's click on header and footer. It's going to change your view. Don't worry about that. That's it's It's supposed to do that. Click on your insert tab. Next, you're still in the page layout tab. Click on the insert tab. And then click on header and footer to the right. All right, so as you can see, um, Excel automatically gives you three sections, a left, center, and right for your header. It's putting us in the center. Let's just, let's just stay there. In the center, type in your first and last name. Oops, why is my not typing? There we go. Remember, type in your first and last name, not mine. Okay. It's happened more times than I can count. I'm happy to take the credit, but this is your hard work. And click into the right section. See the, the little box there? Just click into it and you'll move over. Now we want to put a date here. Whenever we use Microsoft Office, we don't type in the date ourselves. We let Office do it for us. So if you look up there in the ribbon in this special menu, um, you will see a uh, current date tool here. Click on current date. And it's not going to look like a date, but it will when you go to, uh, to your print preview and to print. So there's the date. Now, one last thing we wanna do is we wanna put in a page number into the footer. So still in the ribbon, you'll see the navigation group, click on go to footer. And you'll see it puts us down in the bottom margin. Do we all see that? Okay. In the bottom margin, your page number can go wherever you want, left, center, or right. I'll click in the center box. Again, when we use Office, we don't type in a page number ourselves, we let Office do it for us. Okay, so in the menu above, in the ribbon, we do see a tool called Page Number here in the header and footer elements group. I'm pointing at it right now, Page Number. Click on it. Again, it won't look like a page number, but it will when you go to print. Now do a quick save. All right. And after you do that quick save, um, go to your view tab real quick. Because um, when you do a header and footer in Excel, the, the way we're doing it right now, it keeps us in this view unless we exit it ourselves. So go to your view tab and to the left in the workbook views group, click on normal and you'll be back to this view.
All right, and now I'll come around in a second and just if anybody needs me to fix anything real quick. Uh, but for those of you um, who have everything set up, remember do one last click save, go to file, go to print, take a look. This is how it looks now, much better, right? Okay, we, um, like I said, our page is now landscape orientation. Uh, we increase the scaling so it's much bigger. We can read it better, 150%. Um, we centered it horizontally and vertically. We added our header and footer, and we added the grid lines back to the worksheet. Okay, so if you're happy with the way it looks, go ahead, you click on the big print button. I will grab them and distribute them. You can bring them home, hang them up on the fridge. All right. Now, for those of you attending virtually, I'm going to be turning off my microphone and camera for one second. I'll be right back. All right, uh, oh. there it is. So for those of you attending virtually, if you have any questions about what we covered today, now would be a good time to send them to the GoToMeeting chat. One last thing I wanna show you really quick, I'm not gonna actually do it. I just wanna point out in the page layout tab where we went to the page setup group. Another problem we often have with printing from Excel, uh, which we didn't really get to here, is when um, you have such a large data set that when you have, it, it, it prints out to multiple pages. You can scale it to fit, but it usually ends up being so tiny that you can't read it. So what you can do, um, if it's on multiple pages, what, what ends up happening is, for example, um, let's say orange, red, and yellow here is on a separate page. So I lose track of my labels, right? So I have to constantly go back to the first page to see what they were, bag one, bag two, et cetera, because those are on page one. So you can repeat rows and columns to print on each and every page that comes out so you never have to lose track of that data, all right? And you do that by going to your page layout tab to your page setup group, and you'll see print titles here. Okay, you just select the row essentially that you wanna repeat in this dialog box. All right, rows to repeat at top, columns to repeat at left, you select them on your sheet, and it will print them out onto every, every piece of paper that comes out of the printer. All right, I just wanted to point that out because I do, people have uh, issues with that sometimes. So again, that's rows to repeat at top, columns to repeat at left. And that's in your page setup group under print titles.
All right, I'm back, folks. Let me just bring this up. All right, so thank you for coming to Excel 1, everyone. Uh, the next class in our Excel series will be Excel 2 next Tuesday, March 15th at 5.30. All right, in, in Excel 2, we will do um, a bit of review, okay? So, because it's very, it, Excel is the most difficult program we teach here, so we like to make sure that we have all the fundamental skills down pat. So in Excel 2, we'll do a bit of review. We'll do some different calculations. We will also, I'm going to introduce freezing panes and also inserting comment boxes. So you can leave comments for yourself or for somebody else. All right. And we'll practice formatting again to dress up our data sets and make them look presentable for printing. And we'll, we, we will do a slightly larger data set to give us a little more um, practice, okay, to kind of advance ourselves a little bit. Now, remember that this was recorded. It will be available on our library's YouTube channel on our computer instruction playlist. All right, so to get there, you can go directly to YouTube and type in Mercer County Library System, or if you want to ensure that you get to the right place, go to our website at mcl.org, click on the YouTube icon at the top left of the homepage. That will direct you to our YouTube channel. Once you're there, go to the, uh, go to the playlists in the main menu, and then select the computer instruction playlist. Okay, all of our different library programs are organized under different playlists. I encourage you to check them all out because we have a lot of great stuff recorded. But the ones for the classes here, all those recordings are under computer instruction. All right. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning of class, for those of you attending virtually, we do have handouts for this class and for most of our other classes. All right, to get your hands on those, go to our website at mcl.org, click on services from the main menu, and then select technology instruction. Once you're on the technology instruction page, just scroll down and you will see all the handouts listed by the name of the class. Now, remember, um, we hope you sign up for some more classes. You can sign up from that technology instruction page, or you can just do it through our main event calendar on our website, okay? Or you could always just call or visit a branch and register, um, or I'm sorry, not call, but you can visit a branch or register in person, excuse me. All right, so just check out our computer class calendar. We have a lot of great classes this month. All right, and uh, remember that we are offering uh, this month, we're still offering virtual private sessions. Uh, so if you need a little help with a computer project that you're working on, and you, you just need a little, a few tips on how to proceed, um, you can sign up for a virtual session. We're here to help you. Um, in some cases, we can also help you troubleshoot um, issues with your tech device. All right, so if you think you'd benefit from this, just go ahead and sign up. Again, it's in the same computer class calendar as the other classes. It's, we offer them on select Fridays between 10 and 2. All right, select Fridays between 10 and two, virtual private sessions at this time, they are virtual only. And you'll see them in the same calendar. Just click on private sessions and follow the instructions to book your appointment. If you have any other questions about our technology instruction program, what you learned in this class, anything else, you can always send us an email to techclass at mcl.org. All right, at this time, if you have no further questions, my virtual students, if you have no further questions, you can click on the X in the upper right-hand corner of the GoToMeeting window and then select Leave Meeting. If you are leaving, thank you so much for coming tonight. We hope to see you again in class very soon. All right, I'm gonna stop the recording now.